Hello, and welcome to the eighth lecture in aerodynamics. Last time, we introduced the concept of flow rotation, a metric measured by the fluid vorticity. This tells us whether flow is rotational, meaning the vorticity is non-zero, or irrotational, where the vorticity is zero throughout the entire flow field. If you assume the flow is irrotational, you can develop the velocity potential, a useful function for analyzing irrotational fluids. Today, we're going to be diving deeper into the world of inviscid and irrotational flows, also assuming it's incompressible. This will lead us to the governing equations developed by Bernoulli, and also will allow us to use tools developed by Laplace in the context of aerodynamics. Let's begin. Inviscid, meaning the viscosity is approximately zero, and incompressible, meaning the density is constant, flows are also sometimes referred to as ideal or perfect fluids. This is the start of a number of videos on incompressible and inviscid flows, and today we're going to focus on the governing equations we can develop by making these key assumptions. First, the concept of inviscid and irrotational are used throughout the lecture, so it's important we know the differences between them because they seem very similar. You might be asking yourself, isn't inviscid just equal to irrotational? Although these assumptions are often made together, they are not exactly equal. To produce rotation, we need to introduce a shear stress into our fluid elements. Consider the conservation of momentum in the x direction for an incompressible fluid. Focusing on the right-hand side, let's look at the terms that produce acceleration. First, we have the body force term. Second, there are two terms, one from pressure and the other from viscosity, which are associated with normal stresses. And the other two terms are associated with the shear stresses. You might notice that both of these terms are due to the viscosity. Naturally, if we assume the flow is inviscid, we neglect these terms because viscosity goes to zero. That means all the shear stress terms go away. So, we have nothing that can cause rotation. However, there is nothing stopping flow from coming into our domain with rotation already. It just is that viscosity is needed to produce new rotation. As a result, flow can certainly be rotational while being also inviscid. We should quickly go over again the general thing you will look for to assume your flow is inviscid and incompressible, the main assumptions for today. For an inviscid flow, you want to be well out of the boundary layer and away from solid surfaces. The no-slip condition produces high shear, making viscosity important near a solid surface. Also, as your flow gets higher and higher in Reynolds number, the inertial forces become more important than the viscous forces, and they can eventually be neglected. Lastly, you will want to avoid any areas in your flow with high shear. These velocity derivatives give rise to important viscous forcing, and can't be ignored. To assume the flow is incompressible, it's a bit more clear. You want to be sure the flow is low speed relative to the speed of sound, so a Mach of less than 0.3 is a good rule of thumb. Also, liquids are almost always safely assumed incompressible. Okay, first we have the Bernoulli equation, which states that for an inviscid and incompressible fluid along a streamline, the pressure plus one half rho u squared is a constant. This is one of the most famous equations in all of aerodynamics. The main assumptions here are that the flow is at least inviscid, incompressible, it has no body force, is steady, and is considered along a streamline. Let's take a second and do a simple derivation of Bernoulli that isn't mathematically perfect, but makes it clear where it came from. Start with the incompressible conservation of momentum equations. Let's write them out and then apply the simplifications based on our main assumptions. We remove the derivative in time because the flow is steady. 
the viscosity set of terms because it is inviscid, and we remove the body force term. This gets us the flow acceleration in space, or the convective acceleration, is due completely to a pressure gradient. This is all the same in all three directions, x, y, and z. Here, I'll draw the skeleton that stays the same for all three, copy and paste it three times, and then fill it in with the parameters unique to each direction in a different color. These are the equations in Cartesian space. However, Bernoulli considers things along a streamline. Consider a fluid parcel moving through space. It follows the dashed streamline. Its position can be defined by a function of x, y, and z. However, its position can also be defined by a different function of the position along curve s. So, in a very hand-wavy way, we can kind of turn our problem into a single-dimensional problem by assuming we are describing the position in s instead of x, y, and z. Also, we'll consider the velocity as a single parameter because, by definition, the velocity is always tangent to our streamline, so there is always a single total velocity component. Note here that I use capital U to denote the total velocity, but often capital V is used. Now, let's turn the three conservation equations in Cartesian space into a single equation in the streamline space by considering it along a streamline, which is how Bernoulli approached the problem. We get that the convective acceleration along the streamline is due to a pressure gradient in the streamline direction. Let's get rid of ds on both sides, integrate, and then we'll have an expression that balances pressure and the square of the velocity. The term on the left looks a little bit like the kinetic energy, but it's also called the dynamic pressure because of this relation that it balances a pressure. Putting everything together, we have the Bernoulli equation along a streamline. Note this is not a formal derivation, and it skips some important steps in how we transform from the Cartesian space to the streamline space. Now, you don't need to know the exact derivation, and if you're following along taking notes, you can choose not to take this part. In this derivation, some steps don't seem to have a reason, but it's needed to get the right end result. Let's go through the exact derivation in double time. Start with the conservation of momentum in the x-direction for incompressible flow. Multiply both sides by dx for some reason, and call that 1. We consider flow along a streamline, so we apply the streamline relations. Plug these relations back into equation 1, and we'll call that 3. From calculus, we bring up the definition of a differential and apply that to 3. In another odd step, let's assume we consider the differential of the velocity squared, not the velocity. There is one equation for each direction in space, and then we'll add up all three equations into a single relation. Notice that the sum of the components of velocity squared is the total velocity squared, and on the right we have a pressure differential by definition. Things can be simplified. If we integrate both sides of the equation along the streamline, we get the Bernoulli equation again, but this time more mathematically rigorously. Interestingly, you could also derive it from the energy equation instead of the momentum equation, but we won't do that here. Okay, that ends the exact derivation, and we can get back to the action. If flow is rotational, like this flow over an airfoil, meaning there is vorticity somewhere in our flow, then the Bernoulli equation only works along a streamline. So, the pressure and dynamic pressure of the fluid at one spot is the same as the pressure and dynamic pressure at another along the flow path. However, if we can say flow is irrotational, like a slow flow through a converging duct, then we can apply Bernoulli at any two points along the flow, and we don't have to worry about staying on the same streamline. This is an important distinction, and that's why it's important we understand the difference between an inviscid and an irrotational flow assumption.
If our flow is irrotational, we get a whole new tool to utilize called the Laplace equation. Often presented in the math shortened terms, it states that the del squared of a function in x, y, and z equals zero. Del squared is sometimes called the Laplacian operator, and if the Laplacian of a function equals zero, it is said to satisfy the Laplace equation. This is a super important function throughout all of mathematical physics. It describes electromagnetism, heat, and for us, it describes fluid flow. In the context of fluids, we have two specific functions that can satisfy the Laplace equation. First, the velocity potential, and the second is the stream function. These two functions particularly satisfy the Laplace equation if we make the following assumptions. Inviscid, incompressible, and the new one here is irrotational. There is a Laplace equation for each of these functions, so let's explore how we get them, starting with the velocity potential. The definition of the velocity potential comes from equating the velocity components to their corresponding spatial gradients of the potential. Note, here we have assumed the flow is incompressible, so we have another relationship of the velocity gradients based on the conservation of mass. We can combine this with the velocity potential definition, and we arrive at the differential form of the Laplacian operator equating to zero. This means that the velocity potential, due to the conservation of mass, satisfies the Laplace equation. This is the Laplace equation for the velocity potential in Cartesian coordinates, but we can also write it out for cylindrical coordinates for completeness. Next, we consider the stream function, which by definition is the velocity set equal to the opposite spatial derivative of a scalar function. Now, we want to also consider the meaning of the irrotational assumption, which is that our vorticity is set to zero. Let's recall the vorticity definition for a 2D fluid. Applying this irrotational condition to the stream function definition gives us the following equation. Simplifying, we reveal that this is, in fact, the Laplace equation applied to the stream function. This means that the stream function also satisfies the Laplace equation, mainly due to the definition of an irrotational flow. So, under the right assumptions of irrotationality and incompressibility, both the velocity potential and the stream function satisfy the Laplace equation. Naturally, a question I always ask with a new equation like this is, so what? What do I do with it? You may remember that before, we said the Laplace equation is popular throughout all of mathematical physics, which means they have spent a lot of time coming up with solutions to these equations, which are called harmonic functions and potential theory. This is great for us, because that means that physics gives us a pre-made toolbox to work with when solving these equations. Essentially, they did all the hard work for us. Now, let's end on a practical note. You will use Bernoulli a lot in your career as an aerodynamicist. You use them in wind tunnels, where you can measure the pressure at the big end and the little end of a contraction to calculate the velocity coming out and going into your test section. In airfoils, you can take the pressure on the surface at two points and attempt to relate that to the velocity change along the flow. Entire instrumentation devices, like the pitot tube, are designed around Bernoulli's concept. Here, a probe measures the pressure at a spot where the flow is stagnant and a spot where the flow has velocity. The difference in the two pressures gives you the flow velocity at that point making it a useful fluid measurement device. It might be harder to see where the Laplace equation is useful, but if you find yourself working with theory or computations, often the Laplace equation is embedded into it. 
For example, many CFD flow solvers will solve the Laplace equation away from boundaries, which is much easier than solving the conservation equations completely. Near the boundaries, you can't use Laplace and you need to do a more rigorous flow solving considering the viscosity, and then you mesh the two solutions together. This gives you an accurate depiction of the flow field in as little computation time as possible. And that's it. Let's review. We started by introducing a flow that we consider for the next few videos, the inviscid and incompressible flow. We discussed the difference between inviscid and irrotational because they go together a lot, but they're not exactly equal. With these assumptions, we can form the Bernoulli equation, which we derived in cursory and exact way. We learn that, depending on if the flow is inviscid or irrotational, the application of Bernoulli changes. Then, we introduced the famous Laplace equation and showed that separately, the velocity potential and stream function satisfy the Laplace equation under these assumptions. And, we end with a practical note exploring how we might use each of these relations. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.